Okay, good. So for those of you who, uh, who I'm Pat Langley, um, and I'm the director of the Cognitive Systems Foundation, uh, which sponsors uh, an award, an annual award in honor of Herbert A. Simon. Uh, I have some, I'm sure many of you know his name and who he is, but maybe not everyone. I've been shocked to, to find how, how many younger people in AI don't know about, about the, its founders. Um, he, with Al Newell uh, in the late 50s, invented list processing, implemented the first running AI system, the logic theorist, devised some of the earliest computer models of human problem solving, and even before uh, he helped launch the AI movement, um, he had introduced the notions of satisficing and heuristic decision making um, in humans. So he continued after that and did many other things, including uh, doing seminal work on computational scientific discovery. Um, he just, imp it, Simon influenced the field in profound and far reaching ways. And this prize is, is in honor of his memory. Um, I would say that the, if, he were, if I was going to summarize Herb's concerns, they were with high level thinking in both humans and machines. So we've been having had this prize a number of the a number of years, the list of recip previous recipients. And here is the web page for the 2021 recipient, Anthony Cohn. Um, let me just read you the, the general spiel. The Herbert A. Simon Prize for Advances in Cognitive Systems recognizes scientists who have made important and sustained contributions to understanding human and machine intelligence through the design, creation, and study of computational artifacts that exhibit high-level cognition. So uh, we announced uh, the 2021 prize winner at last year's conference, and let me, let me read you the, the, the statement. The recipient of the 2021 prize is Anthony Cohn, for his research on qualitative representation and reasoning about space and time, cognitive vision and robotics, and visually grounded language processing. Tony received his PhD in 1983 from the University of Essex, where he worked with Patrick Hayes, and he's been on the academic staff at the University of Leeds since 1990, where he serves as professor of automated reasoning. He's been active in AI and cognitive science for over 40 years. His research has focused on central ideas from the cognitive systems movement, especially the symbolic representation of content and its use in qualitative reasoning, as well as the development of computational artifacts that incorporate insights about human cognition. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it over to, to the prize winner and, and let him tell you about, about uh, all the stuff he's been doing the past few decades. Okay, well, thank you, Pat. Thank you to the uh, Cognitive Systems Foundation and to the Herbert Simon Society, which sponsored this. I'm certainly very honored to be receiving this award with such uh, prestigious uh, uh, forerunners before me. So uh, I'm gonna be talking, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna be talking about spatial intelligence for cognitive systems. The actual title in the program is slightly different. It's actually Cognitive Systems with Spatial Intelligence. I changed it round because I'm going to be talking more about the spatial intelligence side of things than focusing on cognitive systems, but it's the clear, two are clearly very interlinked. So um, Pat mentioned that um, I did my PhD at Essex and Pat Hayes um, was my supervisor. And during my PhD, he went off for three months to Switzerland, a place called ISCO, and wrote a couple of se quite seminal papers, the Naive Physics Manifesto and the Logic of Liquids, which was all about his attempt to kickstart uh, or reboot AI's interest in, in common sense representations and reasonings. And in this work, it was clear that the reasoning about space was absolutely critical. And I kind of, this really piqued my interest, and uh, I did a bit of work on that during my PhD, but predominantly on the kind of reasoning side of things. But ever since then, basically my research has had a, a very big focus on, on spatial representation and reasoning. 
uh, mostly on the sort of common sense side of things, but not exclusively, as you can see from this uh, list of um, uh, topics I've been involved in since then. I'm not going to read through all those. You can, you can read them yourself. Um, so space is special. Um, it, all living things must move and act in space to survive. All thought begins with spatial thought. These, these are, are all quotations, in fact, from somebody called Barbara Tversky, a cognitive a psychologist, uh, previously at Stanford and now in uh, Columbia and, and New York. And um, most recently, she wrote this book, Mind in Motion, which is a kind of popular science book. And it sort of really makes the case for the importance of space, it, particularly for humans, but a lot of it in, is then applicable to cognitive agents, cognitive systems. Spatial thinking comes from, is shaped by perceiving the world and acting in it, be it through learning or through evolution, uh, comprehended through multiple modalities, not just perception, but also olfaction, locomotion, uh, amongst other uh, modalities. And at the bottom here, I've put, you know, there's not just, of course, humans which uh, need to uh, act in, in space to survive. We've got honeybees who perform this little dance to tell other bees where the nectar is. We've got desert ants who can wander around the desert all day. At the end of the day, they can make a bee line or an ant line uh, straight back to their nest. We know about homing pigeons. And uh, I was going to show you a, a, a video of Betty the Caledonian crow, uh, but I've I think I'm going to not have time to do that. But that was another example of a bird that is a tool user in the wild and can actually make a shape in order to achieve a particular uh, goal in, in, to get retrieve food. So almost every domain involves spatial information. And again, I'm not going to read all these, but you can scan these and sort of think for yourselves that everything from medicine, robotics, town planning, navigation, uh, could be division. These all, uh, they're not just about spatial representation and reasoning, but it's clearly a crucial part of them. I just mentioned space as a metaphor at the end. It's clear that when we talk about uh, in everyday language, we often use space as a metaphor. You say, I'm, I'm very happy, I'm, you know, I'm really up today, I'm down in the dumps, uh, and so forth. And interestingly, that's, this vertical dimension is such that if, you, uh, if you're up, then it's good, and if you're down, uh, then it's bad. So this talk, um, I've already started talking about why spatial information is especially important and what's special about spatial. I'll say a little bit more about that. I'm going to be sort of, as we go through, you'll see various little red things at the bottom of the slides, sort of some, some challenges. And this is a subset of possible challenges in spatial representation and reasoning. I'll be briefly going through some of the techniques and approaches which my group have worked on uh, over the years. And um, there's some of these open challenges. And this is certainly, uh, you know, this started off when I practiced it the first time, it was two hours. So I've had to cut it down to 30 minutes. So this is very much a selection of, of things. Um, so everyday space is qualitative. We, the way we use, um, we talk about space in language is predominantly qualitative. You go leave the room, you turn left and you go to get to the, to, to the restrooms or whatever. Uh, you, you follow the code, I'm last room on the left. The key is inside the box on the desk. And we tend not to use uh, phrases like uh, the, the text in red on the right here, where we're referring to absolute locations. Of course we do sometimes, it's important that we do, but predominantly our everyday language about space is qualitative. So it's it's clearly important that machines can understand and also generate qualitative natural language descriptions of space. For those of you who know the Winograd Schema Challenge, some of those are uh, particularly uh, spatial, and here's one of my favorite ones there. The trophy wouldn't fit in the case because it was too big, because it was too small. And so the it refers either to the case or the trophy, uh, depending on whether it's big or small. And it's clear that there's no numbers involved at all. Having numbers here, um, unless it, well, I guess you had all the numbers, maybe it might help. But it's clear you can solve the problem without any numbers. So there's many different aspects to quality spatial uh, knowledge, uh, including topology, orientation, direction, size, distance, shape. And I'll be talking about some of these, uh, mostly about topology, but a little bit about some of the others. Most QSR calculi, quality spatial reasoning calculi, ad address just um, one of these aspects, um, perhaps a couple of them. And so there's a challenge then to developing calculi at an appropriate level of granularity, and I'll say a little bit more about that as we go along, with efficient reasoning and taking account of the interactions between uh, the different aspects, such as I've listed at the top here. So our uh, cognitive agents are going to have to acquire their spatial data from somewhere. And this can come from many different ways. It could come from language, text, web. It could come from video, um, cameras. It could come from sensors either on the agent or external to the agent. Um, 
And that data could be in many different resolutions. It could be uh, different underlying ontologies, uh, different levels of uncertainty in different volumes. And so there's this problem then of fusing all this disparate information with different ontologies and different uh, levels of uncertainty, and then trying to make sense of all that, uh, trying to learn and recognize higher level spatial and perhaps spatial temporal concepts uh, from such data. And then with the many tasks which are predominantly spatial, including localization, mapping, navigation, manipulation in robots, uh, visualization, spatial temporal predictions, um, and so forth. And often an agent is faced with multiple simultaneous tasks, which perhaps the most famous is the SLAM task, simultaneous localization and mapping, which uh, uh, any mobile robot is going to have to face. So usually spatial tasks, I've already mentioned, is part of some larger task. I've got the task of you know, giving this conference talk here, and that involves uh, quite a lot of spatial stuff in here, planning how to get here, design, design the sl slide layout, but a lot of it was not spatial. Of course, this is a talk about spatial reasoning, so there's a lot of spatial stuff in the talk, but if I was talking about medicine, then uh, that wouldn't be the case. So the question is, what, what spatial representations and reasoning methods are best for which tasks? Uh, I edit the Spatial Cognition and Computation Journal, my co-editor on that, uh, Dan Montello from UCSB in 1980, 1993, he came up with this uh, paper which was very well cited where he uh, comes up with these four different hierarchies of, of psychological space. So there's figural, which is small, with body, for example, tabletop, vista, which you can apprehend without locomotion, but using your head and eyes to, to look around. Um, environmental, where you have to move around in order to apprehend it. And then geographical, which is so large, you can only apprehend it via maps. And the, the question is then, how does this then affect the design of a spatially intelligent agent? Well, obviously, we have maybe have different representations. We're going to clearly acquire knowledge, spatial knowledge about uh, the world in different ways and the terms will change their meanings things like far and near are going to mean different things in in this tabletop space compared to geographic space um, very often the spatial information we have is vague um, we talk about you know southern england and there's always huge discussions about whether you live in the north or south of england um, um, which um, I, I won't go into here, if you, if you believe in something like a wood or a forest, well, what's the exact spatial extent of it? Does it include the clearing in the middle of the forest or not? Um, so that there's the, and vagueness is basically endemic when we talk, start talking about uh, space in the natural world. Uh, I want to be able to make inferences such as the tree is near the summit of the mountain, the mountain is far from the sea, the tree is not near to the sea, and then, inf and then infer it, the tree is not near the sea. And we're able to give vague localization, such as I'm in the corner of the room without saying exactly where. So, can we represent and reason and present in the presence of such spatial vagueness? So, quality spatial temporal representations, which, as Pat says, I've spent a, a large part of my career now working on, um, naturally provide abstractions. Uh, there are a lot of well developed calculi out there, not just the ones I've worked on, but many others in the community as well. Um, and these usually have a pretty well-developed semantics. And it's important to point out these are complementary to metric, metric representations. We're not claiming that you could do all of everything uh, with purely quality of spatial. You need the metric representations as well, but sometimes you want the quality, sometimes you want metric, and sometimes you need both. So if we think about sort of when QSR really started in AI, it, it sort of really sort of grew out of the QR literature on f physical systems, which was started by De Clear, Forbes and Kuypers in the late 70s, early 80s. And there was a famous issue of the AI journal in about 1981, if I remember correctly. And then Forbes continued working in this area, uh, sort of more in the spatial area through the 80s. And then in combination with his students, such as Boy Faultings, I wrote a paper in 86, which had this poverty conjecture in it. So it said, there is no purely, purely qualitative general purpose kinematics. Of course, QSR is more than just kinematics, but they come up with this third, and perhaps the strongest argument for the conjecture, no total, total order quantity spaces, which have been critical in the earlier work on uh, QR more generally, don't work in more than one dimension, and space is clearly more than one dimension, leaving little hope for concluding much about combining weak information about spatial properties. And so this transitivity was a really important thing. And the question is, can this be exploited in higher dimensions? And so they come up with this um, conclusion that perhaps there's in the space of higher dimensions, there's nothing 
uh, weaker than numbers will really do. And I think the volume of work in the QSR since then has really sort of belied th this claim and, this, and actually things have turned out much better than they uh, uh, pessimistically predicted then. But it's, it's, it is still an issue and that, um, as we'll see later, you do get ambiguity, as you always will do when you talk about um, your reasoning with qualitative information. So there's a challenge there, which the community has been trying to address to provide calculi which allow a machine to represent and reason qualitatively with spatial entities of two and high ND dimensions without resorting to traditional uh, quantitative techniques. So, of course, you can start off with just a 1D spatial representation. Um, you can use Allen's interval al calculus or interval algebra. Uh, we call it Allen's interval algebra. Actually, it was Jean Nicot in 1924 who invented it, uh, but nobody really knows about that um, because it was a book written in French and, you know, we most people don't read French. So, um, but what, what Alan did invent was the transitivity table. And that wasn't in the earlier work because not, Nico wasn't interested in, in inference. Um, so just to remind you, you can see the Alan relationships here on the right hand side. There are these uh, six relationships which are asymmetric. And so they've got inverses of one symmetric relation for equality. Uh, and of course, because I've drawn a figure of this, it's clearly obvious that I can use it to reason about space. The very fact I've drawn it on paper on, on the screen means it is in some sense not only a, a, a temporal calculus but it's also can be used to reason about space 1d space uh, you can extend it there's a so-called Hindu uh, calculus which I forgot to put a reference in but it's uh, Pujari and I think Ligazar if I remember correctly um, uh, is it where you for the the relationships which um, uh, this is going to be hard to use this on there um, which uh, the, the reform meets an overlap relationships, uh, you can talk about whether one region is smaller or larger um, than another, another one. So that then gives you 16 relationships. And this is an example of a combined calculus where we, we're combining two things, in this case, size and the early Allen calculus. Um, we can, um, of course, make a two-dimensional version of that. That's known as the rectangle algebra. There's also a 3D version called the block algebra. And so, uh, you know, that can work, work quite well in the computer vision. It's very common for object detectors then to draw a bounding box around uh, an object. And so what you've got then is rectangles aligned to the X and Y axis. And so in that case, it, it could be quite fruitful. And people have done this to use um, this uh, so-called um, rectangle algebra then to reason about the spatial relationships between objects that they find in, in video images and so you as you project the objects um, you find to the x and y axis and then you apply the Allen out of and algebra to the x and y axis so in this top figure we can say that the orange blob is to the right and below the green blob in the bottom figure um, the orange blob is during the green figure in both the x and y axis which kind of makes it sound like it's part of it but of course it's not and the problem is here we've got uh, concave regions and this is then not going to work nearly so well um, so as I say it can work well in particular domains um, well I've what there's been most work done in QSR is in the area of Mary topology so Mariology is the a theory of parthood topology is when you then add in notions of connection in and so we people talk about merit topological theories and these are usually built on a primitive um, binary connection relationship which is originally due to Whitehead in a paper in 1929 and then a couple of papers by Bowman Clark in the Philosophical Logic Literature in 81 and 85. And this is axiomatized to be reflexive and symmetric. And there's a number of different semantic interpretations of that, depending whether you've got open and closed regions and things like that. And a colleague and I uh, discussed that in a paper in, in the Journal of I can't remember which journal, a journal paper in 2003. You can define many, although this looks like a pretty weak uh, primitive, you can actually define many relationships from it. And here, just a few of those um, very simple ones. Disconnected is just a negation of uh, C. Uh, you can define part to it. X is a part of Y. If anything which is connected to um, X is also connected to Y. And you can define proper parthood by using, say, it's X part X Y, not part Y X. Equality part X Y and part Y X. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all, all the other definitions uh, of the relationships here. You can look them up in the papers. Uh, but then you can come up with this, um, this calculus, which is now known as RCC8, the Region Connection Calculus. Uh, it was Anthony Galton from Exeter University who actually came up with that name. Um, he also noted it actually could uh, stand for the initials of the uh, people who wrote that paper in KR92. 
So here you can see that you, um, stand, you've got these um, relationships are introduced, such as DC, uh, disconnected EC, externally connected or touching, partial overlapping, tangential proper part, which is touching uh, at a boundary, non-tangential proper part, equality, and then those two proper part relationships have inverses, just uh, in a similar case to the Allen uh, calculus. You, often people have a simpler version of it, the so-called RCC5, where we collapse some of these relationships, and this is what I mean about coarser or, or finer-grained uh, relational algebras. So here we've got a coarser uh, algebra where we ignore basically the dis uh, tangential distinctions. We've got a purely meriological rather than a very topological uh, calculus. You can def that we've defined eight relationships here, but there's many more things you can define. You can de define whether uh, a a region has a holes in, you can talk about its dimensionality. I've been drawing on the previous slide, we had 2D figures, but it's not restricted to 2D, it could be 3D or 23D. Um, and you can hear some of the, uh, you can hear some figures here, which um, the calculus can distinguish. Um, we can write, you can write predicates involving ultimately in defining in terms of C, which to distinguish these different situations. Unbeknown to us at the time that we wrote our RCC paper, we had an initial one in KR89 and then the one which is our best cited paper in uh, 92. Um, there were some people in geographical information science, Eckenhofer and his colleagues, who come up with essentially a model from a very different uh, semantic foundation. Here they talk about the boundary, the interior and the exterior of a region and then note whether the, uh, th those three uh, point sets have got empty or non-empty intersections uh, with, with the same um, point sets of a second region uh, Y. And um, that theoretically might give you two to the nine different combinations or relations. But actually, if you make various assumptions about uh, the regions, such as this, they're assuming they're plain and regular point sets, you get down to eight. And those are effectively exactly the same eight relationships that we had in RCC8 which kind of gives us some confidence we're on the right track, I guess. Um, so that was a brief introduction to merit topology, but and we've got, I said, ultimately we might need metric representations as well. Is there anything in the middle? Um, so the kinds of things which go beyond, a more, gives you more information beyond pure topology, uh, things like orientation, convexity, various kinds of shape abstractions. The only kind of shape we can talk about in topology is whether things have holes or not. Um, uh, 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 and uh, some, some of the niche notions being like firm connected, but we can't, it's a kind of pure very topological notion of shape. So, um, so there's a challenge then of finding expressive but efficient semi-metric, these, these things which are kind of halfway between and finding useful shape calculation. That's particularly hard because very small changes in shape can actually have a di bigger difference in uh, a function. For example, consider two cogwheels. If you have your cogwheels ch just change very slightly metrically, it might mean they don't mesh at all, although they look kind of very similar, basically. So orientation is uh, one of the things that's been uh, well investigated. It's kind of a naturally qualitative thing where you have clockwise and anti-clockwise orientations. You need a reference frame, either deictic viewed from the observer, intrinsic if objects have intrinsic fronts, such as cars, which have got a front and a back, um, or perhaps houses have got a front door, or absolutely if you've got some external frame of reference, um, such as the geographic uh, cardinal directions. Uh, most work is 2D, there's a bit of 3D work, and most work has considered orientation between points and lines, which kind of then is a bit of a problem when we are the topolog topological work is all uh, based around a region. So there's a bit of a mismatch there, and people have done, done some thinking about how to combine those two uh, points, and the fact you've got these different spatial ontologies at work here. Um, so there's a challenge then combining region-based merit topology with uh, point-based orientation calculi. Here's just one uh, algebra out of many in the literature. This is one which uh, my postdoc, Amar Isley, worked on in uh, 2000 and appeared at AIJ. Um, so here there are 24, I mentioned previously, Alan had 13 JEPD relations joint, exhaustive pairwise disjoint in, um, in RCC8. We've got eight. RCC5, and here we've got 24. Um, so the, what the distinctions we're making here are whether each of these three orientations is to the left off, opposite to, or to the right of the other two orientations. One thing which we then extended RCC, we went to go from RCC8 to RCC23 by adding a second primitive. And he, uh, with, this is now a function symbol conv. Um, so this uh, convex denotes the convex hull of X, and there's a partial axiomatization of that here. And uh, it means you can then start talking about whether this 
uh, this uh, region A is inside, not part of this island, Concadia, but it's still inside its convex hull. And B is partially, uh, partially overlaps the convex hull, but it doesn't overlap uh, Concadia at all, and C is uh, completely outside. And so you can then define, a, say, uh, a total of 23 relations where we then sort of are disconnected and externally connected then get refined uh, to the kinds of relationships you see here. So at the left, we've got, they're both outside each other, but touching, and then you've got one of them is um, partially inside the first one um, and touching, uh, and the second and then the third one along, it's um, completely inside the convex hull and touching and so forth. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, but then you can do things like modeling uh, the progression of one object, as you see at the bottom here, uh, X was it going to, or if I, uh, going from out, completely outside Y to inside its convex hull, and then finally touching and maybe even going inside it if we refine the PO relationship as well. So con the, con this, adding this uh, notion of convexity actually increases the expressive the, of the language a lot. Um, Ernie Davis came visited me in the um, uh, in the 90s, and eventually this paper came out um, where we it, it, it um, shows that uh, you can distinguish any two bounded regular ranges not related by an affine transformation. So basically, this is enough to and actually give you an affine. Um, uh, theory already. Unfortunately, it's really hard to do computation on it. Um, this is a kind of Murray geom ge geometry, and there have been another of these Murray geometries out there in the literature as well. My ex-student Brandon Bennett came up with one in 2000, uh, where we had uh, it required a second order maximization, and we had two primitives, the notion of being a sphere and parthood, and there's some, some other ones as well, and uh, Borgo and Marcel analyzed that, and one of they did in another couple as well, um, in, in a paper in 06. So I say there are, we've, I just talked so far really just about space, but of course time is particularly important as well, particularly since a lot of the work I've done in applying QSR has been to video interpretation, where uh, we want to understand uh, video and of course the objects are then moving around in time. So we can use Allen's interval algebra and I'll, I'll show you we in fact do that. I've also worked, um, I don't have time to talk about that here on uh, temporal modal logics conjunction with an erstwhile colleague, uh, Michael Zakarayashev and his colleague from Liverpool, uh, Frank Volta. Uh, and there's a question about how you combine space and time. Are you going to treat it as a 3 plus 1D problem or a full sort of 4D uh, ontology? And there's various computational issues, which again, I don't have time to, to go into detail here. Um, one particular issue that arises then as we talk about space and time is the notion of continuity. You want, in general, the world is continuous. Objects move around continuously. They deform continuously. And can we somehow capture that within the context of our quality spatial um, Calculate, and I'll show you that we can in a couple of slides time. So the challenge then is finding useful quality of spatial temporal calculi. One of the ones which has been captured by aspects of both time and space, admittedly in a kind of instantaneous setting, is the so-called quality trajectory calculus, which um, was invented by Nico van der Wege um, in, in Ghent University. And here the idea is we are, we're considering two, in this case, essentially point light objects, and we're considering whether they're moving towards each other, minus, uh, away from each other, plus, or stationary, zero. And you can see the different sort of possibilities here. So at the top left, we've got repel, they're both plussing, so they're moving away from each other. Uh, we've got one can be stationary, the other one uh, moving away, so that's to part. They're both going to be stationary. There can be, one can be pursuing the other one, so that's plus and a minus. Um, a minus and zero means that one of them is stationary, the other one's approaching, and so forth. Um, there's also more complex versions of these where they, you can distinguish 2D things in 2D space. You can say moving towards but to the left or moving away and to the right uh, and things like that. So, um, so far I've just been talking about sort of representations. I haven't talked about um, a reasoning at all. Now, of course, RCC was originally defined in using first order predicate calculus. So there's a temptation to say, well, well can't we just use, uh, you know, the standard techniques for uh, first order predicate calculus, such as first order theorem proving. Unfortunately, it's not decidable as a result, which you can easily adapt from Georgic in 51. So there's a big effort then to try to find decidable uh, sub theories, most of which involve uh, using essentially constraint languages. And we, most of the reason it's done involves composition tables. This is what Alan originally called uh, a transitivity table, but actually because it involves different relationships, composition is better named than transitivity, which is just about one relation. 
So um, there's, you can also use relational algebras, which have got their own uh, reasoning methods. Uh, we've used zero order logic. So these are essentially propositional logics, but where the, the propositions now don't denote, don't denote truth values, but rather they denote spatial regions. So if I say P and Q, it means that the, the regions, P, it's the, there's a region P and a region Q, and we're looking at the intersection of those two regions. Or P implies Q means that P is part of Q. RCC has also been built into description logics such as palette spatial and, and it's, you can see it, there's implementations of it in Psych and SNARK. And a lot of what we've done at these is in various forms of machine learning, so uh, inductive reasoning. So let me just remind you what composition is about. So this is where we have, um, we've got one relation R1 between A and B and we've got, we know a second relation B, R2 between B and C and the question is what's the relationship between A and C? So I suppose the, we know that uh, B is an untangible part of A and C is an, un, C is an untangible part of uh, B, then we can infer completely unambiguously that C must be an untangential proper part of A. So here we've got a unique answer. That's not always the case. Uh, in general, it's going to be disjunction. So here we've got uh, the ta tangential proper part relationship. So B is a uh, TPP of A and C is a TPP of B. So in this case, it still could be a TPP, but if B, um, C was differently situated, uh, like here, now C would be a non-tangential part of A. So you can then build a composition table. So you've got um, on the left-hand side, the, the rows are the relationship between A and B, the, the, the columns of relationship between B and C, and then the entries tell us what the relationship between A and C are. This is about a third full, if I remember correctly. I, the question marks here denote all, all eight relationships. Uh, on, so on average, these, these things are about a third full. And you, the cells highlighted in purple are the examples in the previous slide, the NTPP and PP, which is the disjunction of NTPP and TPP. And so we can use composition tables to check the consistency of knowledge bases of ground facts. Uh, there's a question which arises as how do we actually build this? Uh, we originally we built this by hand. Uh, we then wondered whether we could actually um, automatically infer this. And we did this using a, um, one of these zero order logics. So in this particular case was a propositional intuitionistic logic and the intuitionistic part of it us allows us to capture these, this tangential um, fact because then P and Q, sorry, P and not P is then not a, not a false, but it enables us to capture that, that touching relationship. Um, so I said I talk about continuity. So pretty much any quality spatial relationship, uh, quality spatial um, calculus you, you find in the literature would also have one of these so-called, uh, well, in our original 89 paper, we called it a continuity network, but Frexa uh, um, then built the structure for the Allen Ilterval calculus, which he called the conceptual neighborhood, and that kind of name is stuck in the literature. But essentially, you can think of it as a continuity network. If you look at the uh, diagram here in the middle of the slide, uh, you can see the eight RCC relationships there. And the arrows then tell you what the next possible relationship is, assuming that the objects continuously deform or translate. So you can't get from disconnected to partial overlapping without going through touching external connection in between. And interestingly also, if there's some uncertainty about what the precise relationship is, maybe because things are far away and you can't quite see are these things touching or not, the, 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 this conceptual neighborhood will tell you what are the next most likely possibilities. Or if there's noise, you know, it tells you how, what the next most likely possibilities are to correct uh, the relationships. We can use this as a basis of a qualitative simulation algorithm um, to just in the same way as um, Kuipers, for example, has the QSIM, you can do a sort of qualitative spatial reasoning QSIM. Uh, we, that was a, this paper in um, Sri Cohn and Randall at the bottom, which was in AAAI in 92. We showed how you could then use this as a basis of a, a qualitative simulation algorithm. Um, you could, we've also used this idea to check the, um, the sequences of QSRs extracted from video to see whether uh, we need to sort of mend it at all, do any error correction on, on those sequences of uh, spatial relationships. I brief earlier mentioned this issue of, of vagueness and uns, uh, uh, um, in, in spatial representations. And so what, one response we had to that was this uh, calculus, which we termed the egg yolk calculus, which for what well, I hope is obvious reasons, even if the yolks here are red and green rather than yellow. Um, so here, um, the idea is you, you rep, you've got some region and you've got a, a central yolk, which uh, you say, well, that's definitely part of the region. Uh, so like, you know, maybe this, um, 
big um, part of big Ben or the town of London is definitely part of London. And then London sort of is a bit diffuse. It kind of extends out at least as far as the M25 and maybe a bit, bit beyond. So uh, you've then got this sort of white area of, of the egg, the, the outer penumbra, which then gives you a, um, a sort of an area which you're uncertain about. And if you then think about what the possible relationships with a pair of egg yolks are, and if you're using RCC5 to compare the, the, the four regions involved, then you end up with 46 JPD relations. If it's RCC8, you get 601, but these then actually form 40 natural clusters. And you can then say things like the hill and valley of eight regions, which touch, but you don't actually have to specify where the boundary is. You can also use this to represent location uncertainty as well as boundary indeterminacy. Okay, I'm going to move now on into um, a section of the talk where I'm going to be talking about activity recognition because a lot of what we've used QSRs for over the years has been from um, uh, trying to use QSRs to build activity models from video. And I'm just going to show you, I hope if this plays, yes, um, this is a, a video produced by a couple of psychologists, Heide and Simmel in 19. 44, which is, you can see there's just a couple of triangles and, and a circle there. Uh, and they were originally, uh, people originally asked, well, you know, what do you see here? And it's just a couple of triangles and a circle. But most people actually kind of construct a little story here um, and sort of they say they're people and they're in sort of relationships or perhaps non in relationships and they're sort of angry uh, or sort of fe fe fearful and so, um, and so it's clear what's important here is not the shapes of the objects here at all. It's to do, you know, there's obviously containment going on inside this room. There's the, the following movements and pursuing movements and running away movements. And so a lot of these what, the things you can recognize in this are basically based on the kinds of things I talked about when I talked about QTC, for example. Um, so eventually there's a happy ending for the small triangle and the uh, circle um, who managed to escape. And then the big triangle gets a bit cross, and you'll see um, it gets, re gets really cross here, um, and that's the end. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, it's always good to have a, a video in the middle of your talk. So, um, why might quality spatial representations or spatial temporal representations be useful in computer vision? Well, they abstract away from noise, they abstract away from variation in event performance. I can pick up this bottle with my right hand, or with my left hand. But there's still, you know, the bottle was originally on the table and then moved towards my mouth, it touched my mouth, and then it ended up back on the table. So you can abstract away from a lot of these sort of details, which perhaps are not essential to the definition of drinking from a bottle. And it also means that having built your activity models, then you could describe your activity model in what's hopefully a kind of cognitive way using the quality of spatial relations, spatial relations involved. Now, there's lots of challenges in doing this um, that you get. You, Video is not, uh, vision is, computer vision is not perfect. You often get inaccurate missing detections. Uh, small quantum changes uh, may yield a different quality of relationship, but probably one that's close in the conceptual neighborhood. Um, there's a question out, you know, what, what spatial uh, calculus are we going to use? Um, it turns out that the, the combined calculi are actually less, are representationally efficient, but actually make it harder to do feature selection in learning. So we tended not to use those. And I haven't actually given a specific citation here. I've got a few more on the subsequent slides. Uh, David Hogg, who's a computer vision guy at Leeds, have been working together since basically the mid 90s and produced a whole series of papers with different PhD students and postdocs. Um, uh, I, and sort of working in this area of using quality spatial reasons, representations and spatial temporal reasons to uh, do activity recognition. There is this kind of a bit of a paradox because there's been a lot of work in the uh, QSR literature on reasoning and people have done work on um, intractability and trying to figure out maximal tractable subsets of, of calculi. But actually what we, we find useful in this uh, vision work is just the representation. Right? It's a useful abstraction. Sometimes it can be useful to deduction if you've got partial knowledge that there's occlusions, if you've got multiple knowledge sources which might possibly contradict with each other, you want to um, investigate whether that you have got consistent information and try to make it consistent. But as I say, it's machine learning and perhaps a bit of abduction which is more widely applied. So if we think about how um, we're going to represent a simple interaction like this. Um, so we just got this white blob moving from out inside the gray blob to outside. And uh, with basically there's three 
uh, intervals involved here. There's the initial interval when the white blob is part of the gray blob, and then there's an re um, interval when it's partially overlaps it, and then finally when it's discrete, if we're talking about RCC5. I'm not worrying about the tangential connections. And then we can use the Allen interval algebra to uh, describe the relationships of those three intervals to each other. And then we could use um, standard uh, sort of logical textual representation. And here's one involving holes, but you can use other kind of formats as well, um, where we then we've got the three intervals i1, i2, i3, and then we just state the the three um, this state the Allen relationships between the intervals and the spatial relationships that hold uh, at each particular interval. Or we have this um, this what we call an activity graph, which is this three level graph, which we've used a lot in our work over the years. Um, so at the bottom layer of the, this, we have uh, objects. At the middle layer, we have episodes labeled by spatial relationships. At the top layer, we have our own relationships. And though this gives us a nice compact way, uh, notice that objects only ever appear once in this representation. The single node gives a nice compact way of talking about um, the, the, uh, a particular spatial scenario, a spatial temporal scenario. Um, as I mentioned earlier, noise is a big problem uh, in computer vision. You get, get lots of sort of um, uh, problems with then is what, what I call relational jitter, where sort of the relations are moving around too much. So this is uh, work we did in, in 2011, where we use a slightly different semantics for RCC, which I don't have time to go into here, and an HMM, a hidden Markov model, where we're then able to basically predict when you should transition from one uh, relation to the next relation, um, having trained that HMM. And then if you, when, when I play this in a second, you'll see the top layer, the top, um, row here uh, labeled PSI is point set interjection. So that's the one before we've done any smoothing. And the, uh, the second one is um, the, where we do, do the smoothing and we've got two objects labeled one and two. So uh, hopefully that's now playing. And you can see that the, the top row has getting, got many more relational changes than the bottom row. So it's, it, we get a much smoother uh, set of relationships, which is going to make it much easier to learn activity models. So we can then uh, build, you know, we've got an entire video, we can build an entire um, activity graph from that. Here we're going to have QTC on the top row, uh, a directional calculus on the middle row where we've got things like UR for upper right and UL for upper left and so forth. Um, and a, a, a topological relationship, which is basically RCC with some slightly different um, names uh, at the bottom row. Oops, what happened? Why is this not playing? Ah. It's, it. I'm in some strange mode here. Um, I, I'm in pen mode. I need to get back to non pen mode. Um, uh, which one is it? Right click. It's, uh, buh, 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 buh. I can't see how to get out of pen mode. Um, I'll play it later. It doesn't matter. Uh, but ba you basically, you you get a, a, a large uh, you get a large activity graph, and this just shows you this graph evolving as as you go along. So, was that a time warning? That was a timer warning. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Um, right. Um, so this is, um, we did, uh, this is work on in, using inductive logic programming, uh, where we then able to learn from databases of uh, turnarounds at an airport. Um, and um, we could learn then a model such as this. I mean, the, the actual rule is at the top, but if you just look at the bottom, basically there's the, this is the model for air, the aircraft arriving, and we, we use the zones on the ground, and the it's this, this aircraft's arrival is characterized by these two spatial relationships between the aircraft and the zone on the ground. What's interesting here is that the learned model is better than a hand-specified uh, model uh, with rules done by some of our colleagues in this European project, precisely because ours took account of the noise of the data whilst theirs assumed perfect data. And clearly, no time playing that video. Um, just briefly talk about how we use activity graphs. What the the way we can do this, we have um, 
a, a, we have a library of graphlets, which could be the most frequent ones, or it could be all graphs up to a certain level of complexity. Then we count how many times these graphlets appear in a bigger graph, and that gives us a histogram of these things. Then we can then compare these histograms. And so we've used this, this uh, representation a lot over, over many different papers, um, jointly with my colleagues, David Hogg and the students. Uh, there's an there's a library which we use uh, from this, it was grew out of all this work called QSR Lib, which I, if you're interested, I encourage you to go and have a look at. I, I know Ken Forbes uses this in this work. Um, I don't have to have time to you, talk about it here, but you can see there's lots of standard quality spatial representations built into this. Uh, there's QTC and there's RCC at different levels of granularity and uh, various direction calculi and so forth. Uh, the final thing I was going to talk about um, was uh, just very briefly was this work on grounding language um, to perception. Um, and we wanted to do this in an incremental way so that you, you weren't just going to have one big training set and learn from that. We wanted to be able to have this robot uh, look at scenes and then slowly acquire knowledge about it. And this was going to include spatial knowledge, but also various other kinds of knowledge as well. And it's going to not wasn't going to know anything about the world to begin with. So it's going to have to figure out you know, what kind of colors there are, what kind of shapes there are, what kind of directions there are, what kind of actions there are, what kind of... Um, uh, locations of are and so forth and I don't have time to talk about this clearly uh, but um, there's a there's a paper that came out in the AIJ earlier this year and basically we can then incrementally build up um, with, without keeping all the previous data these the, the perceptual um, categorizations the discretizations of the perceptual spaces and then um, we use integer linear programming to then ground um, n-grams to these, and then we can learn a probabilistic grammar of that, such we can then uh, subsequently recognize new sentences and potentially then get a robot to, to act on those. Okay, that's basically it. The summary, um, which you can read, um, lots, there's spatial reasoning is a, a big, a ubiquitous. There's lots of um, expressive uh, PSR calculi out there. I've talked some of the calculi, some of the challenges in the field. Um, things I didn't have to talk about was you know, how you can learn QSR discretizations, um, about learning robot manipulation skills, as work done on the cognitive adequacy of quality spatial relationships such as RCC8. And with that, I will stop and say thanks to all my colleagues um, I've worked with over the year, to the funding, um, and I dedicate this talk to my late colleague in spatial reasoning, Christian Frexer. Thank you. Do I have time for any questions? I don't know what's. To... Well, it, I practiced it with 35 minutes. Uh... Thank you for the talk. Um, th thank you for the talk. Uh, really, what... uh, is this working? Okay. Uh, what wonderful talk. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, and I think you talked about this towards the end. Um, when you were given, when you're showing RCC, um, and it, it, you know, as it kind of advanced, um, you could imagine that you might always be able to find some exception to uh, the particular level of abstraction. Um, and uh, so, even though our RCC um, was able to model a lot of things, I, I, I feel like there were. Um, different abstractions of that language that could capture things and maybe um, you know if a system was deployed and then it saw some news maybe at some point that wouldn't be able to represent what it needed to because it's not like you know fine-grained enough but it, it, it looked like so, so basically I wonder if you have any comments on that and I and I wanted to ask if the last part of your work that you talked about is that learning those representations like tabula rasa like like completely from scratch or is it still starting at some particular level that a human's kind of deciding we're going to be at this level of, a, of abstraction? Okay, so you're right, of course, and that's always, you know, if you're a knowledge engineer coming in, you're going to decide, you've got to predict the problem, you're going to decide, well, what are the important things? Uh, you, I mean, John McCarthy years and years ago said, uh, if you couldn't tell the machine it, you can't possibly expect to, it to learn it. So uh, you, your representation language has to be expressive enough that you can actually represent the key things 
in your domain and in the problem and the task. So uh, yes, and so many things, RCC is not going to be powerful enough. So you, that's why you've got all these other things like these direction calculi and QTC and, um, and all these other different calculi out there. So yes, and that is, I mean, people keep on inventing new calculi and I kind of stopped doing that at some point because, you know, it was and, until it's driven by the need for a particular task, a particular problem. Um, and so then, of course, as you say, what you'd like to be able to do is to then have the machine automatically learn an appropriate qualitative abstraction for a particular task. And that was one of the things I cut out of the talk. Uh, I, there is a little bit of that in the very last slide on, on the grounding language where the, the system does then learn essentially the, the discretizations it needs to make in order to um, capture the, the what's what's present in, in the videos it, it, it sees out there. Um, so and it was there was this other piece of work I didn't have to talk about we we then um, able to discretize basically distance and and speed uh, in this particular domain I I've got time I could show you the video um, but so you, we can learn appropriate discretizations but we still in both of those we are still pre-told the system about the kinds of the the quantity space so we said that in the last bit of work of grounding language we said that um direction is interesting and we said okay continuous space for direction we said that uh, location is interesting we've said that a distance is interesting uh now if we hadn't put in distance then as a as quantity space to learn about then it wouldn't have been able to learn about that so you know there's i mean there's no such thing as unsupervised learning there's always the human being designing the system is always making decisions about the design of the system and that ultimately conditions uh you know what what the system is able to learn does that answer both of your questions yeah that's great thank you pat yes so you mentioned that rcc had been imported into both uh, psych and spark you didn't mention any cognitive architectures that have incorporated it, probably because they haven't. And I'm curious as to whether you think that's a good idea, whether there are any challenges to overcome. You know, classic work on cognitive architectures has, architectures has always been concerned with time. These are about agents that exist over time. But, and there have been models that do things in space, but they've, none of the spatial stuff has ever made it into the architecture itself. Do you think that's a good idea? Of course. Do you, any, um, do you have any advice for those of us who are interested in that? I should, I should think, I don't want to give a, I, you know, I mean, I'd want to look and see how time is incorporated and try to do it in a way which is sympathetic to the way that time is. Well, made. no, they, I mean, I would say that they exist over time. In fact, our researchers, for example, are very concerned with fitting reaction time data, but they don't, for example, you don't find anything, typically don't find anything like the Allen calculus there either. So, so it's, I would say, except for a little bit of work on episodic memory where you have timestamps. It seems to me a, a major oversight and we need to fix it. I, I completely agree. I, I, if somebody's interested in working on that with me, I'm very happy to, to talk okay, to them. Okay, very good, thanks. Mike. Very compelling. You went through a lot of stuff. Yeah, but sorry. I, <laughs> I, I think I tracked most of that and it was great. I. Uh, so not everything though is is spatial right there's a so much of our lives are focused and obsessed with social reasoning and emotional reactions and reasoning and everything but they're related and often spatial clues exist that give us insight into what somebody is um, emotionally thinking or socially thinking in fact Heider, i was going to say that's going to be my answer yes so has anybody actually used one of these qualitative uh, representations for Hyder and what would needed what would be needed to be added to capture some of the things that you kind of mentioned that that look nervous or the you know the emotional aspects that were we infer from that it's a great question it's a great thing to look into i don't know anybody who's done it nobody's done it i don't know i don't know if anybody's done it and maybe they have but yes. i don't know oh. uh, i mean i mean the, most of the work i know about emotion is either from language I mean, the kind of sentiment analysis stuff, or um, sort of facial recognition, which is there's either just from you know static images, or there's some stuff on you know, videos of, of people's faces. Uh, that's mostly deep learning based, as far as I know. And so, who knows what the, these deep learning systems are doing inside them? Maybe they've they, they've got QTC inside them now. I don't, you know, um, I'm being I'm being flippant. Um, but I don't know if anybody is particularly explicitly looking at those kinds of things in terms of motion. But that, yeah, again, that would be an interesting thing to look has at. This, has the, it been applied po to possibly partly because of a paucity of data sets? I'm sorry. Sorry, possibly 
possibly because of the paucity of data sets. Sorry, you were saying. I was also wondering whether this has been applied to security applications. Right? Used yeah. To, yep. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's work done on, on, on security. Um, and in fact, part of that, uh, well, it depends exactly how you define security, but part of the um, airport example I briefly talked about, um, you know, there was the, it was sort of monitoring what was going on around the plane. Uh, but yes, there's, some of our work has also been in that area. Okay, let me say th thanks, Tony, for a great talk, great summary of what you've done. Uh, various reflections and some uh, question. So you've managed to convey just the sheer complexity of space uh, and um, how uh, you really need to have uh, a good representation uh, for a particular task which you are working on. And I think that's something which I think everybody can lear learn from uh, is uh, get the representation right at the ground floor and so much else flows easily. And I, I think what you've done really shows that to, uh, in a lovely fashion. Um, more general, uh, uh, another question is um, then, how much are you, do you draw on work on vision, perception, mm. and human uh, spatial cognition? Um, do you at all? I mean, clearly there was sort of uh, an informal sort of underlying sort of, um, as I kind of suggest, said at one point in the talk, you know, the fact that sort of human use of that uh, when human talk was spatial, it's predominantly qualitative. So that was obviously um, pushing us in this direction and pushing many other people in this direction of looking at qualitative representations. Um, and I, the work I didn't have time to talk about was then a post hoc evaluation as to whether it actually fitted in with uh, human uh, spatial um, perceptions, uh, human spatial uh, concepts. Um, I'm just trying to think of the specific work I can point to to answer that question. Um, it, people have normally sort of said, have been sort of loosely inspired, but haven't. I'm, I'm sure there is work which has been specifically inspired um, and directly taken account of human um, results. I mean, we've done, of course, it, the work where you're then learning from human data, of course, then you're, it's, it's indirectly, but that's just from empirical uh, you know, performance by humans. I'm trying to think of any work which specifically takes account sort of theoretical um, findings. There is, but I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not thinking of it at the moment. Uh, it's not coming to the front of my mind, but it's, it's, it's a small amount. So I'm also interested in uh, whether it goes in the other direction. So uh, your work, has, has it been taken up by cognitive neuroscientists who then perhaps have tried to look for these kinds of uh, functions um, uh, in the brain? Um, the, the best example I can give of that is immediately after this, um, this um, conference, I'm actually going to visit um, a colleague of mine, a neuroscientist in Houston. And he was a guy who, I just had an email from him out of the blue about probably 10, 15 years ago. And he said, I read your stuff about RCC and he worked on place cells and, um, and um, grid cells, but mostly place cells in, in a lab, but then UCSF. And he said, I'm really interested, you know, could, he had this idea that somehow there was something you know, very topological and, and that he thought that RCC might be the language of the brain. I mean, I, I'm exaggerating slightly here, but, uh, mm. uh, but you know, so we've been talking, we've written a few papers over, over the years and sort of uh, where we've been able to analyze, for example, um, the sequence of place cell firings and actually show you can reconstruct the topology of the maze that the rat's running around. Uh, purely from that sequence of place cell firing using a very simple kind of RCC like analysis. Okay, um, so there's, there's probably a bit more work in this, uh, that as well. I'm trying to think, I think Marcus Nauf might have done something in that area as well. Um, I'd need to sort of go back and think about the literature a bit more to give you definite quotes. Okay, but, uh, but, but not much. Okay. Thank Let's thank and congratulate Tony on the prize.